Good morning. Good morning. How about, let's everybody stand for the opening prayer. Now, if my eyes were a little better, I'd be able to do this, but I can't do it. With joy, we come this day to the house of the Lord. God provides for us abundantly, even when we doubt and fear, even when we turn away. God is faithful. Open our hearts today, O Lord, to hear your word for us, that we may become faithful disciples of our Lord all our days. Amen. seated. Welcome to all. It's great to see you on Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> it's great to see you all here. Um, as we gather, uh, if you are here in person and here for the first time, I invite you to fill out the white welcome card that is in the pew in front of you. And if there's any way that we as a church can be in ministry with you, please make a note of that. Uh, those can be put into the offering plate on your way out. For those of you who are online, welcome, great to see you. Uh, please mark your attendance, say hello, interact with others, and be a part of the worship service in that way. It's great to continue our connection both in person and online, and to be a part of worship together. Uh, just one special note, you saw that I was, I was wearing my mask as I started the service, and Joyce was wearing her mask. Our community, we're seeing a huge increase in the number of COVID cases that are happening. As we know, as we've gotten used to what's happening in the pandemic, every couple of weeks we get a new variant and things seem to surge. And so we're trying to be responsible. If you come in person, just note that it's recommended right now to wear a mask. We're not going to mandate anything, but it's a recommended piece. Uh, and for those of you online, you can wear a mask at home if you want. That's up to you. Uh, I'm not going to, but that's up to you. 
Uh, just a few things going on in the life of the church. As we mentioned, today is Mother's Day. We have a special recognition a little later on in the service, uh, a gift for all the women who are here in church together, and it's great to see you here today. Um, also, note that uh, we are in a new series. We're talking about how do we learn about faith, how do we discover faith, particularly in the midst of our doubts, and we'll be talking more about that during our service together. Um, looking ahead, we have a children's party planned. Uh, for May 20th. This is an opportunity for us to get to know some of the kids in our community and plan ahead for the summer and what we want to do. And so uh, if you have some children who you think would be, enjoy pizza and a movie, uh, bring them by on May 20th. That's a Friday night on 6 o'clock and it'd be great to see them there. Also note that this is uh, the week where we have our council meetings, and so trustees at 6 o'clock and our church council at 7. And uh, if you have some insight or some thoughts that you'd like to share with the church in terms of uh, our direction and what we do, uh, you can always talk with me, but of course you're always welcome to be a part of those meetings uh, to share with us your thoughts. We'd be glad to entertain those together. As we continue in our gathering, I invite us to stand to pass the peace of Christ with one another. Maybe this morning, instead of a hug, you do a high five or a fist bump, however you feel led. Uh, but let us share the passing of the peace with one another now. I'd like to invite uh, David and John to help me out with this. We have a special recognition for all the women who are here as we want to celebrate the mothers who are here. So David and John, would you give me a hand? Thank you. That's what I've always wanted. <laughs> I'm playing them all in one place. <laughs> So I suppose one of the things that's fun on Mother's Day is to recognize uh, some exceptional mothers in our community. I wonder if we might be able to recognize who might be the oldest mother who is with us today. And so uh, let's just, you know, counting, thinking if you can, back to how many of you have been a mother for over 40 years, if I could see hands. Wow, okay, <laughs> that's fantastic. How many have been, oh, Bob, put down your hand. All right. <laughs> <laughs> How many have been a mother for over 50 years? All right, 55, 60, 70? Marge Page, you win. Hello, oh, fantastic. Oh, thank you very much. The other thing we might uh, just note is, uh, how, I know we get great children, uh, grandchildren and great grandchildren. They're all great children, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes. Uh, but I wonder, you know, great-grandchildren, how many of you have great-grandchildren at this point? Okay, we've got several hands up. Okay, how many of you have, like, four great-grandchildren? All right. All right, we've got more than four. Uh, how about uh, five or six great-grandchildren? Jan, how many great-grandchildren do you have? She has more. She has more. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Lois, how many great-grandchildren do you have? 18 great-grandchildren. Let's give her a hand. That's amazing. 
the gift of life that keeps giving. And that is honestly, you know, that's the, the miracle of women. The, the wonder and marvelous thing is that, you know, men, we can't have children. That's just the thing, what God did. You are what God has given us the gift for having children. We're glad that you're able to, uh, to share that gift with the world. Uh, we are recognizing all the women who are here, of course, and sharing this special gift uh, with you. And thank you for the ways that you continue to nurture and share a love with one another and then uh, share that joy with all. And Chrissy has some comment. I can see it in her eyes. <laughs> you tell me an hour later? <laughs> okay. Some special joy joke. I invite you to talk with Chrissy about later on. So uh, I invite us to uh, hear the scripture together as Joyce comes and shares with us the word. How many did we have left? One. One? That was close. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Today's scripture reading is John chapter 20, 11 through 18. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying as she wept. She bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them what he had said, these things to her. Word of God for the people of God. you to be seated. Well, it's great to uh, celebrate this Lord's Day with you, particularly on this beautiful Mother's Day here. And as uh, we celebrate uh, today today about Mother's Day, uh, we reflect on this scripture, this beautiful story of Mary who interacts with Jesus and the relationship between Jesus and Mary helps to example this beautiful, loving, tender relationship that God offers to each of us. As I mentioned, we're in this series where we're talking about how it is we discover faith in the midst of our doubts. And just a little bit of review where we've been. Two weeks ago, we heard the story of Thomas. And uh, Thomas, in the midst of his doubt, was looking for physical proof. I need to be able to put my finger into the wounds of Jesus. And uh, we might remember the Rembrandt painting where Thomas did just that. But we were looking at the historical evidence of Jesus and the testimony of the disciples and that that is one of the forms of proof. One way as we're looking for some concrete evidence for what I believe, we can hear the story of Thomas and recognize that God provides for us the physical evidence that we might need to have a foundation for our faith. Last week as we were talking about the, uh, the two who were on their way to Emmaus, 
We recognize that Jesus gave them another set of evidence for the resurrection and proof of their faith. They explored scripture together. And as Jesus was highlighting the scripture, he was demonstrating the ways that he has profoundly fulfilled prophetic experience and how it is that they can look to the scriptures themselves. And in reading the scripture, they can experience something of God's presence for their lives and have confidence in their faith as they look through the scriptures together. He also broke the bread for them. And as he shared that meal with them, there's a recognition that the same traditions, that same communion meal that Jesus had with the disciples in the upper room, is that same tradition that has been handed down from generation to generation through all of the believers that we celebrate. We last week celebrated communion together. And in a way, we celebrate that connection and that great meal through all generations way back to when Jesus' hands were on the bread itself. And we enjoy that same presence of Christ as we come together. All of these so far and what we'll continue with are ways to help us find some footing for our faith. That when we find ourselves in doubt and wondering, is there such a thing as what God has said to me? How do I know what he is saying is true? These are helping us to find our footing in our faith so we know that we don't have to wander around in our doubts, but rather that God meets us in our doubts to help provide assurance for our faith, to help us move forward with what we have. And the story we have today is such a beautiful story because we see the story of how Mary comes to the tomb, and this is often the scripture we hear on Easter morning, where Mary had come to the tomb with the other women and they had come to anoint the body of Jesus. But of course, they found no body there. They found that the tomb had been opened and their first report was to go back to the disciples and said, somebody has stolen Jesus. Somebody took the body away and we don't know where they placed him. That same question about what has happened with Jesus, what happened to this body, is where Mary's mind has been stuck where is this body? And so even after the disciples leave, we almost see that she has stayed by that tomb. Even though the disciples came and they saw and they left, she was not willing to move on. She had this profound, dear, tender love for Jesus, this hope to find and to bestow on the body of Jesus a, a sign of her affection for him. And as she stood there by the tomb, perhaps alone in her isolation, wondering what may have happened, she finds herself wondering, what do I do now? Where is my faith? Where do I go from this point on? And so we recognize that this opportunity, this question that she encounters as she goes into the tomb, the angels ask her, why are you crying? Now, I love the, the question in itself because we recognize that here she was in her profound grief. She had just lost somebody that was near to her, somebody who had been a meaningful part of her life, and she wondered where she was going to go from that point on. And we hear almost through the voice of the angels, the voice of God, who is asking, why are you crying? Help me know of your, your depth of your sadness. And what's wonderful is all the way through Scripture, we find this experience where God meets us to comfort us in our time of weakness, in our time of sorrow, our sorrow and our pain. I love how in Revelation it talks about, and God himself will wipe away every tear from our eyes. God meets us in our tears. And that's a beautiful thing to recognize that God cares about our suffering. God cares about our pain. God cares about those times in which we are in need of that comfort in our lives. And so it is there that the angels are asking the question, why are you crying? And I believe what's happening is that Mary is in this time of transition in her faith life. Her experience right now is that she is focused on this past, the experience of who Jesus was. But indeed, that faith can sometimes be this experience. Doubt comes about when we realize that there is a transition in our faith, that there is some maturing that needs to happen in our process, that the things that had been good in our faith in the past no longer seem to be relevant, no longer seem to be helpful moving forward. And doubt can sometimes be in the indication that we are maturing or that we are growing in our faith. Perhaps as you come to church, perhaps you, you tie into church because you remember some great experience maybe in your childhood. Or maybe you come to church and when you think about church, the thing that comes to mind is all the beautiful experiences of what has been in the past. I remember for myself when I, you know, my first 
real memory of church is an Easter egg hunt. And I remember somebody dressed up in this giant Easter bunny costume. I think it scared the you know, life out of me. Um, <laughs> there was a blank there. Um, <laughs> And that, of course, it left a profound memory in my mind. And so when I think about Easter, I can't but think about this grassy field with eggs on it and this giant Easter bunny. That's just the first thing that comes to my mind. But maybe there's other experiences that come to mind for you. When you think about going to church, you think about faith, you think about Sunday school and all the, the people who maybe have been in the pews in the past, and you think about how great faith is and you think about the past. And we know that in the last couple years, there's been this interesting transition where we couldn't do church the way we did it in the past. And there's this reality that if we try to live into the past, we miss out on what's happening in the future. We miss out on what's happening in the current present and what God is calling us to be about. And so it makes sense that as we are trying to move forward in our faith, if we're looking backwards, we'll miss where we're going because we're always looking backwards. The golden days of our faith, we think of what happened in the past, and even when we meet together in church council times, we think about, oh, well, all the things we did in the past, we need to just redo those things again. We just need to have more potlucks. We need to have more barbecues. We need to do some sort of activity that we've done, because that always worked in the past. And maybe you think about, well, how do I grow in my faith? Well, you know, I remember in Sunday school, we were taught to pray in this way. And so you you pray the same simple childish prayers, hoping that by doing the things in the past, you'll find God's present now in the same way that God was in the past. But I recognize that what happens more often than not is we come face to face with this time of grief, our time of doubt, because the God of our childhood is not the same as the God who is now alive, who is calling us to grow into our adulthood with God, who calls us into a partnership, not a parent-child relationship, but into a partnership where God invites us into ministry and mission to all the world, and God invites us to grow. But too often, instead of being willing to grow, we get stuck in this time sitting by the tomb of Jesus, by those things of the past, weeping because somehow the world has changed, and we're not sure how to move on. Perhaps there's been other experiences of your life that caused you to get stuck. Maybe there were some bad experiences, bad relationships, a hardness at work or other places where you find yourself stuck in your life, wondering, you know, I I had an experience with God when I was growing up, or I had an experience with God or faith somehow early on, but because of this experience, because of this, I don't know how to move on. Is there a future for me? Is there a new tomorrow with God in it? Or maybe we just find ourselves wondering, like Mary, where did they take him? Where did they take this body? That one thing that I had to hold on to, the, the body of Jesus, the one I could hold on to, is no longer available for me to grab hold of. There is something that is a transition moving forward. And so I believe that what happens with faith is that we need to be able to wrestle with a few things. And one is that we have to wrestle with the past. Those things that had been good for us in the past and recognize that that had been a gift from God, but recognize that even our best days in the past are not near comparing to the things that God has for us in the future. That God calls us into his continuous presence, into the future, into what he is calling us to be about. And our faith journey sometimes is that act of repentance, which just means to turn to be able to turn from those things that we had hold out, held on to as those things that we can concretely hold on to in the past to say, Lord, I need to be willing and be open to your presence to what you might call me to in the future. We need to wrestle also with those things that are lost. We can get stuck on the loss. Maybe there were people who would be in these pews in the past and they're like, oh, well, I'm not sure if I can believe anymore because they're not with me. Maybe there is some other experiences of loss as well in your life where things have kind of got stuck. Jesus meets us in the midst of that loss. As I was mentioning, he meets with Jesus in this, in this time. Jesus meets with Mary in the midst of this grief. And as she's wondering, can there be a future? Sometimes we get stuck in thinking that the world should look a certain way. You know, that, that things need to be perfect in order for things to be forward. And so we, we spend our whole time trying to push everyone into these wonderful boxes of what should be. But the truth is that we live in a broken world. And sometimes it doesn't feel faithful for us to be angry about the world. 
Like somehow we ask, even we ask big questions like, you know, why would God allow for bad things to happen to good people? Or why is it that there's such things as war and disease? Why is it that this world that God created has, you know, tornadoes, has tsunamis, has fires and all sorts of apocalyptic experiences? Why is it this beautiful world that God has is not fit this perfect paradigm that I think it should fit into? I think it's okay for us to wrestle with that. And I think the journey of faith is for us to kind of give up on this picture-perfect idea of the past to say, God, I'm angry about the fact that things aren't perfect. I'm angry that there is evil in this world. I'm angry that there is loss. I'm angry that things are not right. And I think, you know what? God is angry too. (laughs) God is sad when there is brokenness in the world. God did not design the world so that we would experience this brokenness. God designed this world so we'd have a perfect relationship with God. And so when we come around finally to recognize that indeed the world isn't the way it was supposed to be, God meets us in that anger and says, you know, I also am not happy about the way things are. God, of course, not, didn't just sit back in an armchair and say, well, there you are. But God steps into the brokenness of the world. That's why Jesus came. He steps into the brokenness of our experience and says, here I am. Doesn't necessarily solve the broken world issue just now. We are still waiting for that future time in which all things will be made right. But in the midst of this brokenness, in the midst of this loss, Jesus meets us here. And that journey of from doubt to faith is, is simply about this relationship of letting go of the past and saying, God, I'm really willing to walk with you in this brokenness today. To see how you might transform the world through me through my actions, through my words, through my participation with you, that there is something here. Mary, of course, had an uncertain future. Where she was going to go, we're not even sure. She was still stuck at the graveside. Even when everyone else left, she was still there waiting at the tomb for something to happen. So Mary's faith so far had been in a pre-resurrection Jesus. She had belief in a Christ who could do miracles. She had belief in a Christ who could do all kinds of wonderful things, who spoke wonderful words. But she yet hadn't had a faith in a God and a Jesus who was able to overcome death. And so when Jesus shows up to her at the tomb, she doesn't recognize him. I think it's interesting just that the many times we see in Scripture where Jesus shows up and the disciples don't recognize the presence of Jesus. You'd think... How dumb, right? Jesus is standing in front of you. Just open your eyes. But what seems to be consistent is that when we have our mind set on what Jesus is supposed to look like, and Jesus does not fit into our tight box of where things are supposed to be, we often miss out on where God is leading us. And so Mary's idea that this Jesus was dead, this Jesus was somehow taken, uh, he was a, a corpse somewhere else, she was attached to those things of death. She had no understanding of a Jesus who overcomes death, a Jesus who in his very nature is life, and death could have no hold on him. That was a Jesus she did not know. But here Jesus stands in front of her. And of course, in the midst of her tears and her concerns, she misses out on seeing him initially until Jesus calls her by name. Mary. And simply that word, calling her by name, opens her mind and understanding to who Jesus is. All those recollections of those times that she had with Jesus and his voice suddenly breaks through the fog of her distress, the fog of her grief, and she is opened to see this person of Jesus whom she knew. What's wonderful in scripture is that we know that God who created us, created us to have a relationship with God, And that he knows each of us by name. There's this beautiful song that says, You know my name. You know my name. Before I was born, you called me, right? That you know who I am. God knows who we are and God calls us by name. And sometimes we are so stuck that we can't hear it. We're not even sure if we're aware of that. But in the midst of that stuckness, in the midst of our grief and pain and our loss, Jesus meets us there, continuously beckoning us forward to hear his call, to hear his voice. My child, I love you. Respond to my heart. Respond to my love. I've mentioned it several times, but there was a song many years ago by Iris, and the song was, or the 
song is called Iris. In the midst of it, it says, and when everything is made to be broken, I just want you to know who I am. And here is that echo of God who's saying, in the midst of this brokenness of life, I simply want you to know of my heart, my love for you, that you are my child. And so as Jesus calls Mary's name, her eyes are opened. And it's like she suddenly realizes who Jesus is. This is the Lord of life. She no longer has a pre-resurrection faith. She now has a faith after the resurrection in a Jesus who is alive. And that is the faith that we're asked to receive, that as we have our times of doubt, these times of transition, to open our hearts to where Jesus is today, alive, not forsaken in the past, but one who is present with us in this moment, who leads us into this glorious future of who he calls us to be. And here he calls us by name and says, My child, I stand in front of you. Simply open your hands to receive that I am here, that I love you. Now what's fun is that in the Gospel of John, John is often seen as the spiritual gospel because he's often using words as a bit of a metaphor. Early on in John 9, John uh, talks about the story about how there was a blind man who was uh, on the side of the road and Jesus healed him so he could see. And then he goes to be interviewed by the teachers of the law and the Pharisees and they don't believe that this guy was blind. Like, how can you see now? You were born blind. There's no way that you could be born blind and still see. They can't believe the miracle. And as they're interfering with interviewing this blind man, it becomes evident that the people who cannot see Jesus are the Pharisees. And so John is playing this game about who's really blind in this story. Was it the blind man who was willing to see Jesus, or was it the religious leaders who were not willing to open their eyes to the presence of Jesus? And his point is, it was the Pharisees. They were blind because their hearts were hard, because they were not willing to receive of God's presence and to open themselves to what Jesus was doing. And so we recognize this experience that Mary has with Jesus talks about her own personal experience. And it is that story of that personal experience which becomes the evidence of faith. That as we have that personal experience with Jesus, that nobody can take that experience away from us. That is your personal testimony. That is your story of faith. Now, other people might have other experiences. They might be stuck in doubt and fear. But your testimony speaks through that. And in this story, what's amazing about Mary's story was that she did not come expecting to see a resurrected Jesus. You see, in that day, and one of the arguments we still hear today is that people said, well, the disciples went and they invented this story about a Jesus who had been raised from the dead. All along, they kind of knew that he had died, but they were going to pretend that he was alive. Well, that doesn't make sense of what we hear in this story, that this woman who was really stuck in this idea of the grief and death of Jesus, she was not about to make up a story about somebody who was alive. She had not come to meet Jesus because she thought that somehow she could invent the story about a risen Jesus, but she came to anoint a dead body. It wasn't even in her mindset that it would be possible that Jesus would be alive. This personal testimony that she has breaks through her expectations of what was even possible. And so we see this, again, not just with Mary, but with the other disciples. Even with Thomas and the others, the ones on the way to Emmaus, they were not going to be making up the story. They were going back to their old jobs the way that they had lived before. And then suddenly, when they meet Jesus, their life is changed. Changed lives become an evidence, a personal testimony of what God is doing in our lives. How is it that I know that God lives? Because when I pray and I ask for God's intervention in my life, when I ask for God to heal the brokenness in my heart, when I ask for God's forgiveness, I recognize that something truly profound happens in my life. And that may not be something you're willing to hear, but I'm willing to share with you that's what I have experienced. When I call to God and say, God, my heart is broken over the loss of my sister. When I tell you that my heart is broken because I see those who are on the street dying of sickness and poverty, and I ask for your intervention, I see the way you pour out your generous heart in transforming people's lives, and I'm able to give testimony to that. Because Jesus is alive. That is a change of life that we can proclaim We each have our own testimony of what God calls us to and our own personal experience. And so that piece about evidence in the midst of our doubt is that it is a personal experience, meaning that each one of us has our own experience with Jesus, our own encounter. 
sometimes it makes no sense. I, I often tell people a way that I encountered God was as I was watching a Twilight Zone episode. And people are like, what are you talking about? It's like, I was watching that show and it just made sense. And suddenly I knew that God was infinite and powerful. And they're like, I'm glad that made sense to you because it makes no sense to the rest of us, right? It's a personal story. But nobody can discount your personal experience with Jesus because that is yours. It is your story. We also recognize that our own testimonies are powerful, changed lives. Experience with Mary was that she turned from one who was stuck in her grief and loss to one who is now filled with joy and adoration. She clings hold of Jesus, demonstrating her love for him, and he sends her forth, and she goes and says, I have seen the Lord. Now, that'd be an interesting testimony to go to a graveside service and somebody, instead of sitting there at the graveside, is running around saying, I think the person's alive. I saw the person alive. You'd be like, what's going on, right? It changed the world. That is what happened to Mary. Her life was transformed in a powerful way, and her testimony was infused with the power of this new experience with Jesus. It is a powerful experience to share our own testimony. Perhaps you've heard other testimonies, persons who were stuck in addiction. And when they gave their life to God, it was transformed and their lives were changed. I don't know if you know the story, but the person who founded AA, Bill W., Bill Wright, uh, he was in a detoxification, uh, detoxification ward when he said, God, I'm a mess. I know I'm a mess and I have tried my very best to get over this, but I can't do it on my own. Help me out. And he said, in that moment, I felt as if I was transported onto a mountaintop and the breeze filled the room and I felt changed from the inside out. That this breeze of the mountainside just cleansed my heart and there began this transformation of his life. And so that's why it's in the middle of that AA story. It begins by saying, I'm an alcoholic and I can't do any more and I need to trust my higher power to help me out. That's where that came from. Personal, powerful testimony of lives that are changed. And finally, we recognize that those stories are persuasive. Not everyone will hear that story. As Mary went to tell the disciples and said, I have seen the Lord, some of the men said, man, she's nuts. <laughs> right? Doesn't necessarily mean it's going to convince everyone. But they can be persuasive. It can have a chance to give an evidence in other people's lives. They're like, well, maybe I might not believe what Mary said, but when John told me, and then Jacob told me, and then Martha told me, and then somebody else told me, that's starting to line up some pieces of the story that maybe I need to explore it myself. What's wonderful is that each one of us has a story. A story of where God has met us. A story where God has answered our prayer. And guess what? That story that God has given to you isn't just for you alone. But just as Jesus sent Mary and said, go and tell my brothers, your, your, your brothers, the disciples about the story, go and share that testimony, God tells us, go and share your story. Go share your testimony with those you know, people that you love, because those are exactly the mission field that God has sent you to. God doesn't always just send people to India or Iceland or Antarctica or somewhere else around the world. Sometimes the mission field that God is sending us to are the people who live in your household. <laughs> Too often we think of God sending people far away, but maybe he's calling you to share your story, to share your experience of your personal transformation and prayer with the people around you, the people whom you love, your brothers, your sisters, your family your grand, great-grandchildren. That's the story of faith being passed along from generation to generation. And those are exactly the mission field. Now, I'm starting to get to know a little bit about what it means to live in the Northeast. And one of the things I'm discovering about living in the Northeast is that we're very tight-lipped about things. You know, my personal story is my story. Don't bug me about it. I'm going to be very quiet about this thing. But maybe just an encouragement here is that we need to put our story into the hands of God and let God do God's work through us and let ourselves get outside of our comfort zone to be faithful to the calling of God, even if it's a little bit countercultural, to be a little bit weird, to be a little bit of embracing in love with those around us. I think of love as being this opportunity to share God's story in a way that is nourishing. It is not condescending. 
And on this Mother's Day, we reflect on the many ways that mothers shared so many things with their children. And sometimes it wasn't, you know, with the, the rules of the house, but it was simply this loving experience sitting with your child and saying, I love you. Tell me where you're struggling, because I care. That's the kind of testimony that God invites all of us to, to be able to sit with those whom we love, to share of God's power and his transforming grace in that experience. And so I invite us all today to put our stories into God's hands and say, Lord, would you use me? Would you allow for me to share your good news with my family, with my friends? And that this journey of faith, even as I struggle with my doubts, might be an opportunity to share of your good news. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you do meet us in our grief and our loss. We confess, God, that too often we have been stuck, stuck in our faith, stuck in our doubts, not willing to grow, but clinging tightly to the past. God, I pray that you would meet us in this place, in this time. Whoever might hear these words, that you would help us to hear your presence, of your transforming power for our lives. That you would bring into our lives others who might also need to hear your good news. People who we might share your story of your life in us. And God, I pray that you would help us to have confidence, boldness, and courage to share these stories in loving and tender ways. This we would pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite us to stand as we sing, His Eye is on the Sparrow. It's in the black book if you're here in the pews, uh, number 2146. Uh, I invite you to stand.
I invite you to be seated. As we continue in our service, we have an opportunity to respond with, to God with our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. Uh, the offering plate is in the back. I invite you to make use of that on your way out today. Uh, for those of you who are online, I invite you to go through our website uh, on the Give tab. Also, that if you'd like to mail in the offerings, the addresses there are on your screen. Um, in the last uh, month or so, we've been raising some funds to give for Ukrainian relief through UMCOR, which is the United Methodist Committee on Relief. And I want to share with you a short video now about the video, oh, sorry, now. <laughs> It has been really encouraging to see that, that this connectional church works as a connectional church. The support that we received from our brothers and sisters in the United States through Amcor and other channels was a very touching and encouraging sign of love in action. It was for me and for us an expression of belonging together beyond local or national borders. I think that the way God is present in such circumstances that people are willing to, to go beyond their comfort zone, to reach out to these people in need and, and that these people that are coming to other countries are welcome, that they are taken care of and that they are offered a place to stay, a place to calm down, a place to find new orientation and then to move on and to increasingly stand on their own feet again and to, to, to see new perspectives. And I think where through the work of the United Methodists in this area, new perspectives are open up, something of God's presence becomes visible. Pray for peace in Ukraine, pray for reconciliation, and pray for those who are involved in the neighboring country helping these refugees now uh, on their journey to another place or trying to settle down in this neighboring country. So one of the great things about being part of the United Methodist Church is a connection with the United Methodist Committee on Relief. And I'll just tell you, it's one of those privileges that I have to say that 100% of what has been given has gone directly to aid. Uh, and that that means uh, medications, clothing, and food are being delivered directly to people who are on those front lines, people who are refugees. So just recently hearing is a 5.8 uh, million refugees out of Ukraine and within the country, 7.8 million people being displaced, uh, and our contributions are going directly towards that uh, help. And so I'm glad to be able to say that we are a part of uh, that relief effort together as a people. And as uh, we recognize that we have that opportunity because of the gifts and the ways that God has continued to provide for our lives, I invite us to respond with the prayers of thanksgiving for what God has given to us. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the ways that you continue to care for your people, the ways you continue to have poured in your abundance into our lives, and even for the opportunity we have to share, to give abundantly to others as they face need in times of crisis or struggle. And Lord, that you call each of us to be faithful. And so Lord, we would ask that you would receive this offering that we provide before you as a sign of our faithfulness with all the gifts that you have given to us. And this through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I invite us to stand as we sing the doxology together.
seated. We have an opportunity now to share of our joys and concerns in our time of prayer together. And so uh, I lift up this time for you. If there's something you would like us to be in prayer for together today, uh, they simply raise your hand and we'll be able to, uh, to hear those concerns together. Yes. Okay, yes. <laughs> Joy that it's good so far and continue yeah. prayers for their and journey. For the rest of the <laughs> Indeed, for God's mercy is in that journey. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayers. Other joys and concerns we'd like to lift up together. And of course, we celebrate Mother's Day and just celebration of the gifts that mothers have in our lives and all the women in our lives, the ways that they continue to demonstrate God's kindness and generosity. Yeah. Speaking of mothers, May is the month that we uh, generally uh, contribute whatever we can to pathways to pregnancy uh, in Grafton County. And we have 80 bottles. If you would like to contribute whatever you can, you can pick up one of these bottles when you go, and if you can bring it back the first Sunday in June, it would be wonderful. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. Yeah. Pathways to Pregnancy, and so uh, I invite you to give generously to that cause. Others' uh, joys or concerns we'd like to lift up together. Yes. My mom's uh, middle 30s on Tuesday at 1. Great time, sir. Appreciate, appreciate you lifting that up. I've got a, oh, a slide just for that. <laughs> for Jean Chamberlain's service is going to be Tuesday at uh, 1 o'clock, and um, you'd mentioned the uh, Bath Cemetery. Uh, Pine Grove. In Pine Grove. Grove. Okay, Pine Grove Cemetery. So invite us to be part of that. Um, also note that uh, service for Hazel Carr will be uh, here at 11 o'clock on the 14th and invite you to be a part of that. And also uh, one more to mention is that uh, Jacob Kadriak, uh, the service, memorial service will be at their house on the 21st at 2 o'clock. And so you're invited to be part of each of those remembrance of life experiences as that might work for you. Uh, I note that here in the Northeast, uh, May becomes a time where we celebrate a lot of uh, persons who've gone before us in faith, partly because uh, we wait for the ground to be ready <laughs> to receive them. And so uh, we celebrate their life together in this time. Other joys or concerns we'd like to lift up together? I invite us to join our hearts together in this time of prayer. God, as we hear the story of how you met with Mary at that tomb, we recognize that there are many areas in our lives where sometimes we feel we're alone in our own grief and our loss. Sometimes in our tears, we wonder if we can see you at all. But as we hear that story, we see how you called her by name and that you know us by name providing for us the confidence that we are not alone, that we're not lost or forsaken, but that you invite us into your presence, that we might open our hearts and our concerns before you. And so, the Lord, as we have named many at this time who are in need of your care, the families of those who have passed from us as they go through this time of grief and loss, Others, as we wrestle with need for your healing hand, we think about our community that is wrestling with a number of uh, COVID cases in our community, those who are sick. Can we pray for your healing and for your peace? And all these we bring before you through Jesus Christ, who teaches us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite us to stand as we sing our closing song together. Pass it on. It's hymn number 572.
service together. I invite you to turn your hearts and your hands to God in whatever way might be comfortable for you. Are there refreshments downstairs? Yeah. Might be. <laughs> I invite us to uh, hear the benediction. Lord, that you would pour out your spirit on all who are gathered here and all who might hear these words. That we would hear and feel the comfort of your loving, tender presence. That we too might go and share your love with all. And this, in Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace. Thank you.